Hello and welcome to yet another video and in this video I'll be talking about this camera right here. It's the Fujifilm X-T3. Now this camera has been out for a while now I know but in my opinion this camera is still a very very capable camera both in terms of photography and video. So having used this camera as one of my main cameras for the past year or so I just decided to actually make this video so without further ado let's get into the video. So the Fujifilm X-T3, now this camera has been out for a while now, I know, but as I mentioned earlier, it is still, in my opinion at least, a very, very capable camera, both in terms of photography and video. So in this video, it's not really a review video because there are a lot of those on the internet already. It's just more of my thoughts, my personal opinion about this camera, having used it, and what I think about it based on how I shoot. And I hope that this video is somewhat useful, whether you're actually deciding to actually buy this camera or wanting to hear another person's opinion about this camera. So in this video, I'll be talking about the pros, the cons, and the usability, operational-wise, ergonomics, as well as the image, video quality, and also into my conclusion. So first about the ergonomics, usability, and just the overall operational side of things. So this camera, well, it's been out for a while now, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it's a bad camera or anything. In fact, it still feels very solid. I don't really like the grip for some reason. I know a lot of people People buy the grip and just put it on here. I do have the grip as well, but sometimes it's just nice to actually have it in the form factor as well. It's just that I also use DSLRs and Canon mirrorless system where the grip is really much bigger and beefier and coming down to here, it does feel a lot more compact. And I'm not saying it's a cheap camera, like cheap feeling camera by any means. It doesn't feel cheap, but it's just that the grip it hurts my fingers and my wrist a little bit, even if I add the actual uh, grip on here the, like to make it more comfortable. It's just something about really flat, um, edgy design that just makes it not so comfortable to work during a long period of time. Let's say if I'm shooting a wedding or if I'm shooting an event where it could be half a day to like the full day, Working with this camera, of course, the weight is really nice because it's not heavy, but the handling of the camera, this is really subjective to, you know, the size of my hands and what I'm used to. Um, this, just the design of the camera just makes my wrist and my fingers hurt. This camera, unlike the X-T2, it actually finally has a touch screen on here. The, my X-T2 doesn't have touch screen, but the touch screen feature on this camera is not really smooth. So if you're coming from something like Canon, where you can touch anywhere you want, whether it's the menu and everything, you won't be able to do this on the X-T3. Now, it really mainly allows you to um, tap on the focus and everything, and even that is not really smooth. It still feels very, very computerized. I don't really know how to explain that, but it's not really a big deal because you just tap and then the camera focus on that part. And yeah, at the end of the day, it works, but not as smooth as like other system. And while we're on the topic of the screen, I actually would like to talk that I personally like this design more than the fully articulated screen, simply because, well, when I'm doing street photography or photography in general, uh, using this kind of screen is actually faster and more efficient and I can just flip it out like that. Of course, if I'm filming myself right now, here's the downside, I cannot see myself. But most of the time I don't want to see myself anyway because I get very distracted seeing myself on the screen. Like right now this camera actually has a flip out screen, but I'm looking through the lens and not into the framing. But obviously you cannot really frame yourself when shooting videos, especially if you're a one man person filming. And yeah, but here's another pro side of that is this uh, AF assist lamp. It also works as like a tally lamp. So it actually, you can actually program it to turn on when you're recording. So if you're recording yourself, this light would turn on. It's not too bright if you're in the normal daylight. It could be a bit too bright if you're like in a super dark room, but uh, in a normal daylight or lit up, naturally lit up room like this, this is actually pretty okay, you're not going to be intrude or feel intruded by the light being on when you're filming yourself. And this is very helpful because sometimes, you know, the cart can be full and then the camera stops recording automatically or sometimes the camera overheats or things like that and, you know, the video just stops recording and then you just don't know if you're just filming for mini takes like I do. Because I'm not good with talking in front of the camera and I usually have a lot of 
trials and different takes so yeah it's always good to know that the camera is recording for example the camera i'm filming right now doesn't have a tele lamp but because the screen is flipped out i will know exactly if the camera is actually recording and writing to the card which is very useful for example with this camera i just had an sd card in there that wasn't fast enough and i'm recording this in 4k so after like 10 seconds of recording it actually warns on the screen that a uh, recording has been stopped due to the slow writing card so i was able to grab another card and put it into this camera without you know talking over like the whole topic that i really want to talk about and then just realizing it was only recording the first 10 seconds so it's it's really good that they have this another thing is i really like the um tactile feeling of the buttons but i don't really like the clickiness of the buttons if that makes sense so if i just take my xt2 which I have here. This is my favorite design of the buttons from all of the Fuji cameras that I tried, which is actually not a lot. It's only like the XE line, the XT1, XT2, XT3, and the XT10, XT20, XT30, things like that. So it's not really a lot of uh, Fuji cameras that I tried, but out of all the ones that I own and tried, this is my favorite one. The buttons, they also feel really nice and they don't really slip easily apart from the power button. Um, but it's not clicky. This, well, you still hear the clicky sound of everything and all the buttons, but it's way more clicky, clicky on this uh, camera. I guess it's good if you want to know that, you know, it's an intuitive feedback or things like that. I think some people really love the clicky uh, sound or clicky, yeah, clicky sound and a bit harsher buttons. Some really like I guess that's why they actually put it into the camera but I prefer the X-T2 where it's more soft and silent and the wheels well the dials doesn't make as loud of a sound but it's still as clicky like the actual click inside is still as sticky so it doesn't slip easily so that's what I kind of noticed that I like better on that camera than on this camera but that's just nitpicking. So yeah, onto another point, this camera has dual card slots just like the X-T2 or the X-T4, so it's also very nice. And I think it's also the X-H1 that has dual card slots. And I personally like the dual card slots, though I know for the size they can't really do it. I much prefer CF cards over SD cards coming from the DSL DSLR background. And uh, they use SD cards and it's really nice. Um, I usually use it to film as an overflow rather than a backup like storing uh, data onto the actual card because most of the time I'm using this camera as like a YouTube camera so a lot of the videos that you've been seeing a lot of my documentaries and vlogs that I've been filming for YouTube has been from this camera for the past year or so well most of it not all so if you're a follower of my channel for a while now you're definitely used to seeing the footage from this camera anyway and one last point about the buttons and dials is actually the main dials over here I was always annoyed by these dials up here that um, on the X-T1 and X-T2 it's a little bit hard to actually turn but on the X-T3 it's just more like you can get used to it and then naturally turn them but I wish that just like on the X-T4 I know this is the X-T3 but just like on the X-T4 there would like be a faster switch to movie mode than having all to go all the way to the end over here just for movie mode because it's just a necessary amount of time to switch between the two and it's actually very important if you're vlogging or if you're doing short do documentaries like what I did because it's very flimsy and it's always like it's too much time consuming just to flick and it's, it's a little bit annoying overall but yeah that's pretty much the most nitpicking that I have for the buttons and everything otherwise everything is customizable so whether if you want to customize your screen or different buttons and that's pretty good in my opinion because then you can really set all the buttons to do exactly what you want it to do even though some of the buttons are labeled already you can switch the functions around or just completely set it to other functions for example the ael button i switched that to the wi-fi button actually because i do transfer images to clients really really often or just friends or other people I take pictures of so it's just a really nice fast access and I program one of the buttons to be turning on or off the 
eye autofocusing system because sometimes, actually a lot of times, this camera focuses on different things that isn't face or isn't eye. So when it comes to autofocusing system on this camera, which is a new topic already, the autofocus is fast and accurate, but whether or not it's focusing on the right subject is a different story. But unlike many other mirrorless cameras, let's say from Panasonic or so, this camera, when it confirms that it's in focus, it really is in focus and it is really fast. But you know, it's not always focusing on the subject that you want to focus on, even if you set the box to that subject. If the subject is smaller than the box, then it will just focus on the stuff around it anyway. So yeah, that is not entirely the camera's fault, I'm aware of that, so take that as a grain of salt. But for example, if you turn on face detection and you're, if you're shooting like outdoors, sometimes it actually recognizes tree branches as face rather than the actual model face you have in front of you. I haven't really got a footage of that because I never really film myself shooting outside, so yeah. And even sometimes when I'm filming indoors like this where, you know, this is a very controlled environment and my face is actually very clear, this camera, this Canon camera actually knows where my eyes are and it's been focusing on my eye the whole time, but with this camera sometimes very little, uh, it would really focus on like my headphone at the back as a face or my like the lens yeah i think the lens of that camera as an eye so it it is really annoying sometimes and unlike other brands when it like when it thinks something is a face you cannot really cancel that if it thinks something is a face, it's going to be so convinced and it's going to be sticking to it. So yeah, that's the downside. But the bright side, as I mentioned earlier, if it gets in, it's really locked on. And it's really accurate and fast. So yeah, there's the pros and cons there. I think it's something that they are able to fix in firmware, but you know, they, they really have to work on it because it's also a very similar story with the X-T4. Now onto the last point, which is the menu system, how you operate it, how you access it, the easy of use and everything. Now, a lot of Fuji fans will get offended when I say it's not the best organized menu in the world. I usually get a lot of hate comments and hate towards what my, my viewpoint on that. But as someone who works with, you know, like Canon, Nikon, Sony, Lumix cameras as well, and being able to access menus as quick as possible in the most efficient way as possible uh, really matters a lot because I don't really want to guess where the company might be putting certain features in, in which sub menus in and so on and so forth. I just want to easily access the menu to the feature in the most natural way and Fuji doesn't really allow me to do that all of the time. It's been improved in terms of like the organization, not the design, but the organization compared to the X-T2, given the fact that this camera actually adds a lot more features than the X-T2. So yeah, I'll give them credit for that. But the menu is still not really efficient if you compare it to like Nikon and Canon. It's not as bad as Sony, but it's just not as good as Canon and Nikon in terms of the uh, efficiency and the speed of actually accessing certain menus and everything. And sometimes there are glitches and every once in a while it actually gets stuck and freezes a little bit. Now that is actually once in a while. Like if you really put the camera to like through under a lot of pressure from shooting and everything and then you access the menu and try to operate everything quickly, I find that this camera will actually reach the point where it just freezes and you just have to pull out the battery because the power button doesn't even function. So yeah, just to keep that in mind. But otherwise, if you just need like basic quick features that are already, you know, on the buttons and everything, then, you know, this camera is just as fast as, well, almost as fast as other cameras. And what I mean by almost as fast is if you're coming from like a DSLR background where you're using dials really quickly to adjust your settings, then, you know, in my opinion, using these dials up here, the like having the um, ISO and the shutter dial here can be easy and very intuitive to use, but also time consuming because on DSLRs it's just using the dial and just really quickly and you're just there. Oh, and I just remember one last point about the usability on this camera. It's actually not on the camera itself, but on the actual Fuji software for 
wireless connection for transferring data from your camera to your phone. I feel like Fuji is not as bad as Sony, but still one of the worst. <laughs> if you look at Canon and Nikon, it's actually, it loads much faster the thumbnail on your phone and it freezes less on the phone and when you transfer the even the compressed version of the uh, pictures from the camera over to the phone it's much quicker with the Nikon and the Canon system and also if you transfer the full version it's still much faster with those systems than Fuji. I feel like it's actually more of the software's fault that they can improve but you know, for the past few years I've been using Fuji, it hasn't really been improved in terms of speed that much. And so what I really don't like is you cannot transfer RAW, whereas I haven't tried on the Nikon yet with transferring RAW, but transferring RAW on a Canon actually works. And it actually also works surprisingly quickly. At least I can confirm that for uh, iPhone users, not sure for Android yet. But yeah, but it should be the same. So it's really quick, even if you're transferring RAW regardless of compressed RAW or original RAW file. So that is something I'm really missing on the Fuji. So you can only transfer JPEGs on here as far as I'm aware of and as of this recording time. They, I, I really hope that they will improve the uh, connectivity but also the uh, transfer rate and also more reliable rate because sometimes it just disconnects for some reason if you're transferring a lot of big uh, files. So. It's just something to be aware of if you're really dependent on actually transferring a lot of files from the camera to the phone. So being a person who usually shoots a lot of RAW anyway, well, always shoots RAW, I feel like I always have to shoot RAW plus JPEG on this camera, which further limits the actual buffer and also the certain performance of the camera while shooting because it's, you know, shooting two different uh, formats onto the card and writing that onto the card the whole time. So yeah, it's also kind of like a waste of space for me because if I'm only shooting raw, that would be nice, then I would have the extra room to shoot more pictures. Whereas if I'm shooting raw plus JPEG, so that I can just transfer the JPEG onto the phone later, it's eating up like the JPEGs at the, at the end of the day or at the end of the shoot, it's just eating up a lot of space as well. Because some shoots you can come home with like 400 images or 800 images or 2,500 images and even if the JPEG is small file JPEG, but you know, if you like shoot 400, 800, 1,500 images or what have you, they add up to a lot of space. So, and those space can actually be used for extra images for raw. So yeah, but if you're not shooting, but if you're not like transferring your images to your phone very often, you usually just put it into your computer, then the argument that I just made is just you know, um, just nonsense really for you. So yeah, but anyway, now into the uh, pros and cons side of the image quality and the video quality. The image quality out of this camera is great. Um, I do agree with a lot of uh, photographers who use different brands as well that Fuji color is nice, but very, very hard to edit and very, very hard to make it natural. Before I came to Fuji or when I only started Fuji, I I was not really sure what they meant by that, but after using different Fujis and also using Fuji for a couple or actually several years now, I do really agree that Fuji colors, it's it's nice, but it's just hard to make it natural and also hard to actually edit when compared to many other brands out there. But in terms of the actual file that you get with the X-T3, it is really nice and you can really tweak it a lot. For a crop sensor especially, the processor is able to really um, take a lot out of the sensor and you can really bring a lot of shadows and highlights back. There's a huge amount of dynamic range in post. So the pictures you get first is actually quite flat, whether you shoot in RAW or JPEG. And especially if you compare to the older Fuji cameras. If you're just starting out with the X-T3, the picture still looks great. But if you're just comparing to the older Fuji cameras, like even the X-T2, Straight out of the camera, the X-T2 will look better in my opinion. But the files will not be as robust as the X-T3 if you are really into heavily editing. And that's where the X-T3 actually shines is when you're doing your workflow. If you're actually doing a lot of retouching, a lot of editing, the files is going to be more robust to actually handle the heavy grading, heavy 
editing and everything and so if you're actually traveling a lot and you're going to so many places that has a lot of tricky lights this camera will definitely deliver you better result files at the end of the day than the X-T2 for example but then again this is really depending on your needs so just to keep that in mind and despite the resolution bump is not such a high bump it's just a increment minor bump from the X-T2 the details on this camera, well, the details from the images out of this camera is actually really nice. If you zoom in, it's just... I cannot really explain it, but like, I think it's one of the sharpest images out of the crop frame sensor cameras I've ever seen. But then again, I've only worked with Sony, Pentax, Canon, Nikon, Lumix, so I cannot really say for the whole thing. So, but... In terms of like for clarity details and everything out of this sensor from this camera it's really nice the sensor is nice the processor is also really good that it's able to you know process that amount of detail out of the sensor but here's the downside of the image quality that you're getting out of this camera at least in my opinion and it's really biased towards how i shoot because i started photography with nikon and canon cameras and i like their roll off into the highlights better and it's i think it's more natural but in, on the Fuji side, I think that despite having such a huge, huge, huge room of dynamic range on the X-T3, but when you do run into like tricky lighting, like lighting scenarios and condition where the highlights will definitely be, be blown out, the roll off into the highlight isn't really as natural as, you know, Canon and Nikon, but that's really specifically towards, you know, coming from Canon and Nikon. But if you're starting up with Fuji, I think you're just going to be used to it and you're just going to be fine. And especially this camera has a lot of dynamic range, so you're not going to be running into that problem a lot of times. So, yeah. And if you're just a casual shooter, just shooting JPEGs, not raw, then this camera is actually fine. The JPEG out of this camera is also great. But if you're just really relying on film simulation, I feel like the X-T2 might be better because straight out of the camera, the film simulation on that camera is much better. So is the X-T20, in my opinion. It just looks nicer and with film, whereas this, it looks more flat and blunt if you compare it to those cameras. But that's just my opinion. But it's still nice overall. And it's still a type of JPEG that you can tweak to a certain extent. And if you're just gonna be posting on social media and you're not taking it seriously, then the JPEG is definitely has enough quality to it to actually do all those edit basic editing and then just posting. And one last point, which is actually a positive point about this camera that I really, really like is the control of the aliasing, moray, and other artifacts from the sensor that you get with many other cameras as well, even modern day cameras. This camera is really well controlled and I really, really like that. And it really makes it a really, really nice and versatile camera to, you know, take it everywhere, especially for its price nowadays. You're getting a really detailed sensor, really nice output image quality, whether it's RAW or JPEG in general. And being a sensor also doesn't show a lot of moray, aliasing, things like that in photography is really great because to me, even if the sensor, like assuming if this was a 12 megapixel sensor, if it had more moray or aliasing on this sensor, I wouldn't take it. But if it like remains the same dynamic range and everything, but had like really well um, moray control, aliasing control, things like that, it would definitely, be a good deal for me because those moray and aliasing is quite distracting and this camera seems to deal with it just fine and much better than the X-T2. The X-T2 was already pretty good but this just takes it to a whole new level for me so if you're really annoyed by the aliasing and moray this camera will do a much better job. Not that it will completely eliminate them I think that for now the technology is not really there. You will still see those patterns at some point, whether a lot or very, very little, but it's still there. Just that this is really, really well controlled and I really like that. And I shoot a lot of travel photography as well, as well as like weddings. So fine patterns is something that is there, like always there. So having a sensor that actually able to 
cope with those environments really, really helps a lot. So yeah, now over into the video side of things. The video side of things is really great out of this camera. The quality is nice, it's sharp, you're quite used to it if you follow me for a while, that most of the videos of the past seven months or a year have been filmed with this camera. I took it with me and filmed like documentaries, filmed vlogs, filmed travel, filmed a lot of videos that I'm sitting in front of the cameras like this and the autofocusing system for the most part does a really, really fine job, at least with this lens. And I like, this is my favorite lens I have with this camera. It's this 16 1.4. I never really take it off this camera unless if, you know, I'm really having to zoom in or whatever. But 95% of the time this lens stays on this camera. It's my favorite lens, but it's also like, in my opinion, the best lens to film with because Fuji lens motors aren't like most of their lenses aren't really calibrate for filming if that makes sense because I think part of the reason why the autofocusing system in the Fuji cameras in general aren't that reliable is also to do with the lenses that you know most of the lenses aren't made like or weren't made to focus in video I'm not saying it's loud but it's just the uh, motor doesn't really keep up and the motherboard inside doesn't really want to keep up either so it also causes a little bit hunting for the camera at points as well so yeah and I feel like that this is just the best match because like out of all the other Fuji lenses I have this is just the most accurate one that focuses in video as well but anyway back to the actual video quality this camera really allows you to output video quality at a really high resolution of 4k you can also do 4K 60, but also keep a note that um, the higher resolution with the higher capability of the camera in general, the more crop you'll have. So if you're shooting 4K 60, you will definitely have kind of a crop on there. So imagine the frame right now that you're seeing me. Um, the actual crop on the uh, camera, if I were to apply 4K 60 on here, you wouldn't really, you would only see half the frame, half of this frame, and it's just gonna be a much small, like much smaller frame in total than what you're seeing right now. Because right now on this camera, I'm using the same focal length as I would use or film with this camera, because usually this camera sits on that tripod almost permanently. So, yeah. Well, when doing YouTube videos, of course, <laughs> almost permanently. So on to the next point is actually not about the actual quality of video, but actually about the preamp on board in this camera. So the preamp in this camera is actually quite nice. You can actually get away with just using a mic plugged into the camera or just a built-in mic because the preamp in here does a pretty good job of trying to keep the audio clean. It's not the cleanest in the world, of course, and you're gonna be better off actually using an external audio recorder that's always going to be better than using an internal mic or internal preamp but in terms of preamp inside for cameras Fuji has one of the nicest preamps I've actually used so it's pretty clean compared to many other cameras could be cleaner but you can easily easily fix that up in post nowadays uh, editing software actually allows you to clean up audios quite nicely and quickly and they're about actually nowadays better than before so it's really nice and this is actually very useful if you're doing vlogs or documentaries that you have to be constantly on a go where you don't want to be recording audio separately but just plug the mic into the camera so that's just really good and convenient and this camera also allows you to put your headphone jack in um so well plug in your headphone and then just listen to the audio audio and monitor it, so it's actually really nice. And the next point is actually kind of pro and con, depending on how you see it, is actually the video that you're getting out of this camera, despite the film simulation. I really love their black and white film simulations. I really, really love it on here on this camera, more than X-T2. But it's really, you can really see that it's meant for editing more than just straight out of the camera. It's still good and detailed, but if you're looking for something that like you can see the colors popping or you can see like the film effects really there like the color changes then something like the X-T2 would be better because on here it's still kind of flat compared to the X-T2. I don't know how to really put it but I always have to apply certain lights or certain look to it whereas with the X-T2 out of the camera I can just upload right away because 
I know that even the color is not natural, but it has its own look to it, which is still its own character and everything that I kind of like. But here it's kind of in between, so you can you still have to tweak it in my opinion. Is it detail and sharp? Yes, it's detail and sharp, but also very natural and it's not too digitally sharpened like on the X-T2, um, but it's still nice. Don't get me wrong, the overall video on the pro side is nice, but if you're looking for something like a really pronounced film simulation that the X-T2 would also have, then the X-T2 will be more pronounced at those uh, film simulations and the color will also pop up more. So yeah, but that's really depending on your taste. It could be both pro and con, depending on the situation you're working in and also what you're really looking after. And since this video is already very long, but I still have a lot more points to really say about this camera, I would actually like to wrap it up here into the conclusion. So this camera is still a very, very capable camera. You can find it brand new for about a thousand euros, most of the time much less because it's usually going on like promotions, whether it's like on the counter discount, like the some big camera store chains will give you like automatically at the counter discounts doing their promotion and Fuji also runs cashback system as well which sometimes you can get a little bit of money back so it makes it even a much much cheaper camera to get for the feature it's really nice I got mine for around 780 euros so it was it was just by luck <laughs> really and while well, most of the time it's roughly 980 euros 950 euros so to speak with tax on of course so I really got mine for a really good deal but there are a lot of these deals going around nowadays, just have to wait for it. And when you do get that deal, it just becomes like a bargain to really get because, you know, like this camera for its feature sets that it has, you know, like sure the battery life might not last that long, but you can still, you know, use the extra money that you save to get more batteries, better lenses, things like that. And, you know, the operational side of this camera is not bad. I love the viewfinder. It, the refresh rate is really good. It's nice, big and bright inside, and it's very, very accurate as well. Many mirrorless cameras doesn't perform well in low light when it comes to the um, the EVF inside, and the refresh rate isn't good in either. Or some mirrorless cameras will be more saturated in the EVF or less saturated in the EVF than your final result. But I feel like every time I look into, or every time I use the view file, sorry, the EVF in here, it's just very very accurate to the final result that i'm getting so if i'm just looking through yes it's not the best in the world but it's still very very nice to use and refresh rate is there and having a big screen inside it's just you don't feel like you're looking into a tunnel <laughs> so yeah it's it's really such a good point and being an APS-C size camera isn't that big of a deal either because it can actually work to your advantage as well. It allows you to actually have smaller lenses inside and Fuji does have a nice series of small lenses with weather sealed in there and it's just a nice overall system to really, really use. And also a lot of people will love these buttons here that shows everything. I'm kind of neutral about it. I much prefer the traditional DSLR way or the Canon and Nikon uh, dials that you know it's, it's much quicker for me to work in the field rather than having to look and adjust here and maybe micro adjust here it's just a bit fiddly for me so I don't hate it I'm just neutral about it it's just my preference is more with what Canon and Nikon are doing with their cameras but of course that's not really as stylish as this if you're into style this is also really nice and being a camera that actually has a lot of features but also maintain a really, really small profile means that it's light, you can take it to many other places. If you're into like street photography, if you're into portraits photography, this camera doesn't feel as intrusive because of the size and people will just take you less serious. So it's really important if you're really focusing on, you know, shooting daily life, shooting, you know, street photography and everything and just want to be sneaky and yeah. And also one last thing is the silent shutter. I love shooting silently with Fuji cameras because it still delivers really well since the Fuji X-T20, X-T2, X-T3, X-T30 and onwards. I feel like since the X-T2 it's only been good since that camera. The X-T1 is not really good in silent shooting really. But um, in terms of quality, it's, it's really nice. You can really work with it. Obviously you're not really going to be shooting a lot of fast moving subjects with the uh, silent shooting because it's not really there yet. 
but for daily life it's definitely more than good enough and you can really take a lot of nice candid street photography or any other photography that you know isn't really fast moving but needs to be in silent mode for example wedding photography if you're in a church where you know the ceremony is taking place i recently shot a wedding with this camera the 1dx i absolutely absolutely love shooting with this camera it's one of my favorite cameras to shoot photography wise and also sometimes video but this camera is extremely loud and having this camera that is this much this much smaller and also very very quiet well able to shoot very quiet it's just a huge bonus for like the guests the you know the priest who's there or other people well depending on which cultural wedding ceremonies you have there will be a moment where having such a quiet shutter will matter so much so yeah so yeah overall i do recommend it again just you know the price the features that you're getting with this camera the quality of the images the ability to really add it a lot like heavily on your images if you're into that then you know this camera you cannot really go wrong it's a nice camera to use it can be frustrating at times especially when it comes to the autofocus system if it's convinced of something but if you can live with that or if you're used to that then yeah or if you have your way to work around it then yeah it's, it's pretty good furthermore fujifilm actually has a lot of like companies third-party companies like producing accessories for them so if you're into like putting accessories on your cameras like the shutter button um, cover special case and everything then you know it's still quite a fun camera to go for and whether like in my opinion whether you're shooting for professional work or for your personal work this camera is still a nice camera that will actually meet many expectations and will get many many jobs done reliably and the last bonus being it's weather sealed. I don't really baby my camera when I'm out in the field. I drop this camera from a really, really high point on the concrete. This is dented and it survived. I dropped this camera before. Most of my cameras are weather sealed and have been dropped, most of them. Um, so yeah, it's not like I'm clumsy, but when I'm working, I don't want to care about my gear. It just needs to work. And this is definitely one of the cameras that I highly recommend if you need a gear that also, not only that it produces quality files, but also to let you work reliably. And yeah, that's it for this video. If you need a free photography guidebook for beginner, it's absolutely for free. It's on my website. The link is down in the description below. And if you have any comments or anything you want to add, please feel free to write down in the comment section below. I'll try my best to read and answer them. And yeah, thank you very, very much for watching. Stay safe, have fun shooting, bye.